Okay, welcome back. Again, lockdown from e medicals. <laughs> okay, just just one second, please. Just one second, please. So let's continue. And um, like I said, all right. <laughs> Please pay credit. Okay, all right. Wow, Sunny Sunny. <laughs> Break is for 15 minutes. Okay, chal. All right. So um, this is as far as the. Um, We said the work done in breathing and what happens in the airways, what happens in the medium sized airways, right? Medium sized airways, like I said, have got a maximum resistance to airflow. And the reason for that is the pattern of airflow, which is turbulent in the medium sized airways. Okay. Now, uh, the next thing that we're going to discuss over here is um, what, what do you understand by partial pressure? What is the partial pressures? What is the partial pressures, right? Now, for example, let's have a look at this. this is again your basic knowledge which you've done in school. So we're just going to revise that. Now, at sea level, at sea level, the atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure, is seven sixty millimeters of mercury. Seven sixty millimeters of mercury. Now, if I want to know how much is the partial pressure of oxygen, we will take the percentage of oxygen, which is 21 upon 100, into the atmospheric pressure, right? Atmospheric pressure. That means at sea level, what is going to be the partial pressure of oxygen? Atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. So what is going to be the partial pressure? Percentage of oxygen into the atmospheric pressure. And at sea level, therefore, you have the at sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen will be 21 upon 100 into 760. 21 upon 100 into 760, which is 160 millimeters of mercury. This is going to be the partial pressure of oxygen. How do you calculate the partial pressure? Take the percentage of oxygen. The percentage of oxygen is 21, 20.9 or 21% into the atmospheric pressure that will give you the partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen, right? Now, at high altitude, now, at as you go in high, in high altitude areas, in high altitude, there is number one, a decrease in the atmospheric pressure. There is a reduction in the atmospheric pressure. And that is, if you remember your school level knowledge, why is there a decrease in the atmospheric pressure? As we ascend upwards, the air becomes rarefied. There is a decrease in the atmospheric pressure, right? But please remember the percentage of oxygen, percentage of oxygen remains unchanged. There is going to be no change in the percentage of oxygen. Composition of air composition of air is unchanged. Composition of air remains the same. There is no change in the percentage of oxygen. If you go to high altitudes, there is a decrease in the atmospheric pressure. PB is atmospheric pressure. And barometric pressure. This is also called the atmospheric pressure. Percentage of oxygen is going to be unchanged. But what will happen to the PU2? The PU2 will reduce. There will be a decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen because of a decrease in the atmospheric pressure. For example, if I give you a question that the atmospheric pressure is 500 millimeters of mercury instead of 760, this is 500. How much is going to be the partial pressure of oxygen? This is 21 upon 100 into 500, which will be 105 millimeters of mercury. 
105 millimeters of mercury. This is what is meant by partial pressure. Partial pressure of oxygen will be 21 upon 100 into whatever is the atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure, if it is 500, the partial pressure of oxygen will be 105 millimeters of mercury. Now, the next important point here is, once we've done this, the next important point, let's see that, and that is, um, uh, now I've already discussed at sea level, at sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen is 160 millimeters of mercury. We've already discussed that. Yes. Now, as we inspire, as we inspire, this is the trachea here, the major bronchi, right? And this goes into the lungs. Now, as we inspire, there are some changes which are going to take place. And what are these changes? When you inspire, number one, there is addition of water vapor. The air is brought to body temperature, number one. And number two, there is a humidification of air. There is addition of water vapor. Now, what is the partial pressure of water vapor which is added to the inspired air? This is 47 millimeters of mercury and this is irrespective. This is irrespective of altitude. This is irrespective of, of altitude or the environmental temperature. It is irrespective of the altitude or the environmental temperature. The partial pressure of water vapor, which is added to the inspired air. Remember, there is a humidification of the inspired air. And the partial pressure of water vapor is going to be 47 millimeters of mercury. And this does not depend either on the altitude or the environmental temperature. Because where is this water vapor coming from? This is coming from the epithelial cells lining your respiratory tract. Right? Epithelial cells lining your respiratory tract. Now let us see what is now what will happen to PO2. See what is what do you understand by partial pressure? Partial pressure means that the partial pressure of oxygen plus the partial pressure of nitrogen is going to be 760 millimeters of mercury. That is what is meant by partial pressure. Oxygen is 21% and the nitrogen is 79%. These are the two major gases in the atmosphere. So when I pressure of oxygen and partial pressure of nitrogen will be equal to the total pressure which is 760 this is at sea level but when i hum when i inspire there is addition of water vapor so now what will happen is now the partial pressure of water vapor partial pressure of oxygen plus partial pressure of nitrogen plus partial pressure of water vapor will be equal to 760 water vapor has been added Total pressure cannot be more than 760 because your airways are communicating with the atmosphere. Total pressure will remain at 760. But humidification of air, humidification of air will now reduce the partial pressure of oxygen and the partial pressure of nitrogen will also reduce. But reduction in partial pressure of nitrogen makes no difference to us. We are concerned with partial pressure of oxygen. Atmosphere, the partial pressure was 160. As we inspire addition of water vapor, there is a reduction in the partial pressure of oxygen. And uh, uh, like I said, why is there a reduction in the partial pressure of oxygen? Because water vapor has been added. Where does this water vapor come from? This comes from the, uh, the epithelial cells lining your respiratory tracts. Now, as the air goes into the alveoli, as the air goes into the alveoli, another change happens. And the next change is the addition of CO2. Please remember the only source of CO2 is the blood. So from the blood, CO2 enters into the alveoli, right? The only source of CO2 is the blood. There is hardly any CO2 in the atmosphere. Whatever CO2 we breathe out, it is used by the plants. It dissolves in water bodies. So hardly any CO2 in the atmosphere. So the only CO source of CO2 in the alveolus is from the blood, right? Only source of CO2.
in the alveolus is from the blood, right? This is from the blood. Right? Yes, I'll repeat it. Now, y'all come late and then after that, penalize me. Okay. I said, what is partial pressure? How do you calculate the partial pressure? Partial pressure is percentage of oxygen into the atmospheric pressure. What is PB? PB is the atmospheric pressure. Now, at sea level, the partial, pre the, the partial pressure of oxygen will be 21 upon 100 into 760, which is 160 millimeters of mercury. Whenever you want to calculate the partial pressure, take the uh, atmospheric pressure and uh, you, percentage of oxygen remains fixed. And that's exactly what I told you. At high altitude, there is a decrease in atmospheric pressure, but the percentage of oxygen remains unchanged. Composition of air is the same, right? And now if the, if the percentage is unchanged, but the atmospheric pressure reduces, the partial pressure of oxygen will now reduce. For example, I give you a question. It, this is 500 millimeters of mercury. PO2 will be 21 upon 100 into 500, which is 105. Now, at sea level, how much is the partial pressure of oxygen? 160. What do you mean by partial pressure of oxygen? Partial pressure of oxygen plus partial pressure of nitrogen will be equal to 760. That is, the, that you, that is what you mean by partial pressure. The total pressure exerted by the gases in the atmosphere is 760. Oxygen exerts a partial pressure of 160, nitrogen exerts a partial pressure of 600. This depends on the percentages. Remember, these are the two major gases in the atmosphere. Okay? Now, as air goes through the respiratory tract, it is going to be humidified. Humidified. The partial pressure water vapor, which is added to the inspired air, is 47. And this is irrespective of altitude or the environmental temperature. Second change which happens is CO2 comes from the blood into the alveolus. Two changes have happened. Humidification, addition of CO2. So what will happen to the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus? This will now decrease. It will be less than the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere. Please remember what is A? Capital A is alveolar air. Small a is arterial blood. Capital A is alveolar air. Bolo, yahan tak samaj aaya? Okay. 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 All right. So this is your. Uh, uh, this is the Bishish is fully saturated. <laughs> okay now this is as far as your so the point i'm trying to make is alveolar o2 is lower than the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere okay so my next point is how much is the alveolar o2 alveolar o2 kya 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 puja hari prasad what have you written why is the total partial pressure ka matlab kya hai Partial pressure ka matlab hai? Pressure exerted by a, by a component of the atmospheric gases. Partial pressure of oxygen will depend upon the percentage of oxygen. Partial pressure of nitrogen will depend upon the percentage of nitrogen. Atmosphere may partial pressure of oxygen and nitrogen is equal if some total is 760. When you add water vapor, some total will remain 760. Q760, kyunki? Air in the trachea is not independent. It is communicating with the atmosphere. So total pressure cannot rise. Total pressure will remain 760. So the partial pressure of the other gases will reduce. Right? Oxygen ka partial pressure kam hoga, usse hume farak padta hai. Nitrogen ka kam hoga, usse hume koi farak nahi padta. Isn't it? And the second thing which happens is addition of CO2, which will cause a further reduction in the alveolar O2. Right? Now, partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus, this is given by what is known as the alveolar gas 
equation. This is given by the alveo alveolar gas equation, right? So what is this alveolar gas equation? This says PaO2. PaO2 in millimeters of mercury. Shivani Thakur, specifically, specifically for you, since you were asked, scroll up. At least I should scroll up when there is a doubt. Okay, here you are. What, what is your doubt, Shivani Thakur? If there is something else that I can help you with, please let me know. Anything more? I'm waiting for you, Shivani Thakur. Hello? Anything else that you want? Okay, so PaO2 in millimeters of mercury. This, what is the alveolar gas equation? Let's try and see this, right? Alveolar gas equation, PaO2 in millimeters of mercury. This will be P, this will be Okay, this will be PiO2 minus the alveolar CO2. PiO2, what is I here? I means inspired air. PiO2, partial pressure of oxygen in the inspired air, minus the alveolar CO2. Alveolar CO2 divided by the respiratory quotient. What is respiratory quotient? We just discussed. Respiratory quotient will determine how CO2 in the alveolus. And what is this? This is going to be the atmospheric pressure minus the water vapor pressure into the fractional concentration of oxygen into the fractional concentration of oxygen. This is PiO2, partial pressure of oxygen in the inspired air minus the alveolar CO2 divided by the respiratory quotient, right? And this is now your complete alveolar gas equation. This is used to determine what is, uh, what is PaO2, PaO2, right? Alveolar partial atmospheric pressure minus the water vapor pressure into fractional concentration of oxygen minus alveolar CO2. This first part of the equation is the partial pressure of oxygen in the inspired air. Right? Minus, see, why are we subtracting the water vapor pressure? Remember, addition of water vapor reduces the partial pressure of oxygen. Why are we subtracting the alveolar CO2? Because addition of CO2 is reducing the partial pressure of oxygen. Have you understood? Right? This is used, this is your alveolar gas equation. That means at sea level, if I solve this, what is it going to be? This is 760 minus 47 into the fractional concentration, which is 21 upon 100 minus alveolar CO2. Alveolar CO2 will be the same as the CO2 in the arterial blood. And arterial blood has a CO2 of 40. Normal RQ, respiratory quotient, we'll just discuss respiratory quotient in detail. Respiratory quotient is 0 0.8. When I solve this, I get an approximate answer of 100 millimeters of mercury. Yes, there has been a numerical problem which has been asked from here, right? Uh, please understand that what is this? Uh, why is there, let me just take this concept once again, trying to explain it to you, what will happen to the partial pressure of oxygen. Partial pressure of oxygen atmosphere, we have calculated at 
at sea level was 160. Yes. As we breathe in, there is addition of water vapor, which is 47 millimeters of mercury. There is also addition of CO2 and the partial pressure of CO2 is 40. Yes. Because of these two things, addition of water vapor, addition of CO2, the partial pressure of oxygen will reduce. How much is going to be the partial pressure of oxygen? This is given by what is known as the alveolar gas equation. What is alveolar gas equation? Alveolar gas equation is PiO2. PiO2. PiO2, which is an inspired air, minus PaCO2 divided by respiratory quotient. What is PiO2? This is atmospheric pressure minus the partial pressure of water vapor into the into fractional concentration of oxygen. Uh, and this, if I solve, gives me 100. Point I'm trying to make is partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere was, was 160. By the time oxygen reaches the alveolus, it is now reduced to 100 millimeters of mercury. Why is it reduced to 100? Because of two changes. What are the two changes? Humidification and addition of CO2, right? Addition of CO2. Vishal Lakotia interested in nitrogen, isn't it? Nitrogen ka partial pressure bhi kam hoga. Nitrogen ka partial pressure bhi kam hoga. Lekin that does not matter, na? Nitrogen is not something that is important for us. There will be decrease in nitrogen as well. Correspondingly, jaise oxygen kam hoa hai, jaise nitrogen bhi kam hoga. Because of addition of water vapor and CO2, but that does not matter. Have you understood? Right? Vishal Lakotia, that it, this is, okay. Now, this is as far as your, um, okay. So, this is as far as the alveolar gas equation is concerned, right? Now, what is respiratory quotient? I told you, I will discuss it with you. What is respiratory quotient? Respiratory quotient. This is respiratory quotient or sometimes also known as the respiratory exchange ratio. Respiratory exchange ratio or RER, RQ or RER means one and the same thing. What is respiratory quotient or RER? This is going to be the volume of CO2 produced. Volume of CO2 produced divided by the volume of oxygen consumed. Volume of CO2 produced divided by volume of oxygen consumed. For a carbohydrate diet, for carbohydrates, the RQ is 1. That means oxygen consumed and CO2 produced is equal when you are, when you are on a carbohydrate diet. But for a mixed diet, mixed diet, the RQ now reduces to 0 0.8. Why 0 0.8? That means the oxygen consumed is more than the CO2 produced. This is what happens. This is what you mean by RQ. It is also known as the respiratory exchange ratio. Respiratory exchange ratio. Okay. This is a volume of CO2 produced divided by the volume of oxygen consumed for on a carbohydrate diet, it RQ will be one. Volume of oxygen consumed to metabolize carbohydrates and volume of CO2 produced is the same. But in a mixed diet, RQ is going to be 0 0.8, right? 0 0.8, right? Now, uh, this is your alveolar gas equation and what is RQ, right? Now, um, please remember, somebody was asking me, what is this alveolar CO2? Where, what is the source of CO2? Blood. So the CO2 in the alveolus, the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveolus is the same as the partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood, right? And that is 40, right? Partial pressure of CO2 in the alveolus will be equal to the partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood. Capital A is alveolar, small a is arterial blood, okay? Now, um, the next important point is, uh, why do I want alveolar O2? Why is the alveolar O2 important for me? Right? We have discussed that the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere was 160 millimeters of mercury. 
By the time it comes into the alveolus, the oxygen is reduced to 100 millimeters of mercury. Why is it reduced to 100 millimeters of mercury? Because of humidification and because of addition of CO2. Now, why is this alveolar partial pressure of oxygen important? Because this is, this will determine how much is going to be the arterial O2. Arterial O2, right? P small a O2 will be equal to the P capital A O2. Small a is arterial, capital A is alveolar. Please remember, when I say partial pressure, this is the dissolved oxygen in plasma. This is the dissolved oxygen in plasma. P small a O2 will be equal to the P capital A O2, right? Dissolved oxygen in plasma in arterial blood will be equal to the partial pressure of oxygen, oxygen in the alveolus. P small a O2 will be equal to the P capital A O2. Okay. Okay. Right. This is based on the Henry's law. And what is this Henry's law? If you remember your gas laws, there was Boyle's law, Charles law, Henry's law. What is Henry's law? Henry's law states that partial pressure, partial pressure of a gas in a solution, partial pressure of a gas in a solution, that means the dissolved gas, yes, partial pressure of the gas in a solution or the dissolved gas, partial pressure of a gas in a solution, that is the dissolved gas in plasma, is equal to, equal to the partial pressure of the gas gas partial pressure of the gas above the solution what is gas above the solution this is going to be the alveolar air alveolar air henry's law states that the partial pressure of a gas in a solution here the solution is plasma dissolved gas in plasma this will be equal to the partial pressure of the gas above the solution. That is known as the alveolar, that is the alveolar air. So partial pressure of gas of oxygen in the arterial blood will be equal to the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. This is the significance. That is why we want to know how much is the alveolar because alveolar O2 will determine what is the arterial O2. Have you understood? Because oxygen will move from Oxygen will move from the alveolus into the oxygen will move from the alveolus into the blood. Isn't it? Oxygen will move from alveolus into the blood, into the plasma, from the uh, from the alveolus into the plasma. And the partial pressure of oxygen in the plasma will be equal to the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus. Yes, this is the significance of the Henry's law, right? Please remember, al arterial O2 will be equal to the alveolar O2 provided, provided VQ ratio is more than or equal to 1. If VQ ratio is less than 1, I have already discussed it with you. That means less oxygenation of blood. Then this, these two values will not be the same. Arterial O2 will be in fact less as compared to the alveolar O2. Yes, provided VQ ratio is more than or equal to one and provided the respiratory membrane, the thickness of the respiratory membrane is normal. Thickness of the respiratory membrane is normal. That means there is no fibrosis, no edema, no fibrosis, no edema. If there is fibrosis or edema, then the exchange will be reduced. Diffusion of gases will reduce. Right? So this is the significance of knowing the alveolar O2. Alveolar O2 will determine the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. This is because of the Henry's law. But here there are two riders, two important things. And that is number one, VQ ratio should not be less than one. And number two, respiratory membrane should be normal. Right? Basundra Chakrabarti, partial pressure pehle to, pehle zada hai. Then eventually it will become the same, na? Eventually it will become the same. 
right? See, RQ will determine the RQ will determine how much is the partial, how much is the CO2 being produced. If you're using carbohydrates, then the CO2 produced will be the same as the oxygen consumed. Take it? All right. Mixed diet, more oxygen is required, isn't it? Okay, this is based, this is biochemistry. Biochemistry will tell you more about it. Why you need more oxygen? Because you need it to break the bonds. Yes? All right. Partial pressure is same, nahi hai. eventually same. Basundra Chakrabarti, ultimately it will be the same, isn't it? Yes? Ultimately, first the partial pressure of the alveolus is more, venous blood is less. Then as oxygen diffuses from the alveolus into the blood, eventually they will become the same. Have you understood? Okay, now this is as far as your, uh, the uh, why, what is the significance of knowing the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen? Now, let us have a look at some normal values. What happens in arterial blood and what, what happens in What are the normal values? Now, let us see what are the normal values for arterial blood and for venous blood. And for venous blood, yes. Arterial blood, the PO2, PO2 is in millimeters of mercury. And remember, PO2 res refers to the dissolved oxygen in plasma. Dissolved oxygen in plasma. Please, Kuldeep Tyagi, Basundra Chakrabarti, just listen to what I have to say. I'm discussing your doubt. Abhi ho jayega. Adarsh Kevi, abhi aapka doubt clear ho jayega. Lekin thoda sa patience rakhye. Mat type ki je beta, distract, distracting hai. Don't worry, we are doing it. Let me at least, please give me a chance to explain. Right? Let's not go ahead of ourselves. We'll only end up messing up things. You know, ek aur, please be fast. Matlab, karun to mein ka, kya karun, jaun to kaha jaun. Please listen and I'm not going to listen. Look at the chat now. I'm also, my patience is also worn off. PO2 in millimeters of mercury, this is going to be the dissolved oxygen in plasma. In arterial blood, the PO2 is 95 millimeters of mercury. Venous blood is 40 millimeters of mercury. Total O2. Total O2 in ml per deciliter. Uh, saturation. Saturation of hemoglobin. This is in percentage. Saturation of hemoglobin. SO2 refers to the saturation of hemoglobin. Saturation of hemoglobin of the arterial blood is 97 to 98%. Venous blood is 75%. So when I say saturation is 97 to 98%, what does that mean? That means, now if you know the hemoglobin has got four heme. When each heme has got an oxygen E, when each heme, each of the four heme has got an oxygen each, that is known as 100% saturation. What happens in the case of the venous blood? Out of the four heme, three have got an oxygen and one does not. So the saturation is now reduced to 75%. Saturation refers to the SO2 is a percentage. It refers to the saturation of hemoglobin. Arterial blood, arterial Arterial blood is 97 to 98% saturated and venous blood is 75% saturated. So if you look at the total O2, total O2 in ml per 100 ml of blood, arterial blood has 19 ml per 100 ml of blood and venous blood has 14 ml of oxygen per 100 ml of blood. These are normal values which you should know. What happens in arterial blood? What happens in uh, what happens in the venous blood? Then let us see what happens to PCO2. PCO2 in millimeters of mercury. Arterial blood, the PCO. Yes, these are Yashwan. These are important values which you have to write, which you have to know. These are important values which you cannot afford to forget. PCO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury. And this is 45 millimeters of mercury. PCO2 will be, carbon dioxide will be higher in the venous blood. If you look at the total CO2, 
total CO2 in ml per 100 ml. This is 49 ml per 100 ml and this is 53 ml per 100 ml. Then the next important point, what is the oxygen consumption? What is the oxygen consumption at rest? Oxygen consumption at rest is 250 ml per minute. Even when we are at rest, we are consuming 250 ml of oxygen in one minute. CO2 production. CO2 production at rest. CO2 production at rest is 200 ml per minute. This now tells me how much is the RQ. RQ, I have discussed it with you already. This is carbon dioxide produced in unit time. Carbon dioxide produced in unit time divided by the oxygen consumed divided by the oxygen consumed in unit time divided by the oxygen consumed in unit time so this is 200 ml per minute divided by 250 ml per minute ml per minute ml per minute will get cancelled this gives you an rq of 0 0.8 Oxygen consumption at rest, this is a standard value. These are important values. 200 ml per minute. CO2 production at rest, this is 200 ml per minute. So what is um, the RQ? RQ is CO2 produced in unit time divided by oxygen consumed. 200 ml per minute divided by 2 ml per minute, which gives you an RQ of 0 0.8. These are absolutely standard values, which we should know, because unless you know these values, you will not be able to understand respiratory exchange. So let's see this once again. Let's go through them once again. PO2 dissolved oxygen in the plasma in arterial blood, 95. Venous blood is less, 40. Saturation of hemoglobin, 97 to 98% saturated in arterial blood, 75% in venous blood. Total O2, 19 ml per 100 ml in arterial blood, 14 ml per 100 ml in venous blood. PCO2, 40 millimeters of mercury in arterial blood, 45 higher in venous blood. Total CO2, 49 ml per 100 ml in arterial blood, 53 ml per 100 ml in venous blood, higher. How much is the oxygen consumption at rest? Oxygen consumption at rest is uh, 250 ml per minute, CO2 production at rest, 200 ml per minute, giving you an RQ of 0 0.8. I told you that we consume more oxygen as compared to CO2 produced in unit time when we are on a mixed diet. RQ on a car, if you are only taking carbohydrates, then CO2 produced and oxygen will be equal to the oxygen consumed. Right? So this is as far as your... Um, this is as far as your standard values are concerned. Now let's have a look at the respiratory exchange, right? Respiratory exchange. Now, when you look at respiratory exchange, let's see. We've discussed this already that the PO2 of the atmosphere, partial pressure of the atmosphere, oxygen in the atmosphere is 160. This is all at sea level. By the time it comes into the alveolus, the alveolar O2 has been reduced to 100 millimeters of mercury. We've already discussed that. Alveolar gas equation. Two changes, humidification, addition of CO2. Right? Now, if I look at a pulmonary capillary, this is a pulmonary capillary. Pulmonary capillary receives this is the venous end of the pulmonary capillary. Venous end means the blood which comes from the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery blood is deoxygenated blood. It is venous blood. It comes from the right side of heart, right ventricle, right? So this is venous blood. Venous blood now, we've already discussed the PO2 is 40. Saturation of hemoglobin is 75%. PCO2 is 
45 millimeters of mercury. These values, please refer, I have just discussed it with you. Okay? This is uh, venous blood, PO2 is 40, saturation is 75%, hemoglobin is 75% saturated, PCO2 is 45. So now what happens is, now look at the difference in partial pressure. Somebody was asking me, how does the diffusion take place? Now listen to this. Partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus is 100. Venous blood is 40. Higher partial pressure in the alveolus. So oxygen will now move from the alveolus into the pulmonary capillary blood. This is the movement of CO2 is higher in the pulmonary capillary blood, venous side 45. There is zero in the alveolus, right? So this is now uh, carbon dioxide will move from the blood into the alveolus, oxygen from the alveolus into the blood. But how does oxygen diffuse? Oxygen diffuse? Oxygen will move from alveolus first into the plasma, dissolved state, and then bind with hemoglobin. Plasma oxygen reduces, partial pressure of oxygen in the plasma reduces because oxygen goes and binds with the hemoglobin. Oxygen will diffuse from the alveolus into the plasma, bind with hemoglobin. More oxygen diffuses from alveolus into the plasma, bind with hemoglobin. So when the hemoglobin, on the arterial side, the saturation of hemoglobin increases to 100%. Once it increases to 100%, then the PO2 on the arterial side will equilibrate with the alveolar O2, which is 100 so on the arterial side of the capillary, arterial side from the pulmonary vein, the saturation of hemoglobin is now 100% and the PO2 is also 100, similar to the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. PCO2, on the other hand, is now reduced to 40. PCO2 is reduced to 40. This is how exchange happens in the lungs, right? Now, blood from the pulmonary vein, blood from the pulmonary vein goes into the left side of heart. It goes into the left atrium. It goes into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, it comes into the aorta. It comes into the systemic circulation. Now, from a systemic artery, when I take PO2, PO2 is now reduced to 95 and saturation of hemoglobin has been reduced to from 100 to 97 to 98 percent. Okay? 97 to 98 percent. Why has this happened? Pulmonary vein, the PO2 was 100, saturation was 100 percent. Left atrium, left ventricle, by the time it comes into the iota, if I take a sample from the iota, the PO2 has been reduced to 95 and saturation has re been reduced to 97 to 98%. Why has this happened? Why has the PO2 reduced? Why has the saturation reduced? Right? And the reason for this is what is known as physiological, physiological shunting. What is physiological shunting? Physiological shunting is a part of venous blood. What is physiological shunting? This is part of venous blood from the coronary circulation, from the coronary, from the coronary and the bronchial circulation from the coronary and the bronchial circulation, they, this part of venous blood drains directly into the left atrium. They drain directly into the left atrium. Venous blood is deoxygenated blood. It mixes with the oxygenated blood in the left side of heart. So PO2 reduces from 100 to 95, saturation reduces from 100 to 97 to 98. Please understand this is physiological. This is not a pathological problem. This is an anatomic anomaly, anatomic anomaly, which is present in everyone. 
small part of the bronchial circulation, small part of the coronary circulation drains directly into the left atrium. Deoxygenated blood will be deoxygenated blood will mix with the oxygenated blood in the left side of heart. This is what is known as physiological shunting. Physiological shunting. Now, this blood from the aorta, it goes into the systemic capillaries. Systemic capillaries. Yes, this is the systemic capillary. Now, PO2 on the arterial side, and this is the arterial side of the systemic capillary. PO2 on the arterial side is 95. Please remember, exchange will happen only at the le level of the tissue capillary, systemic capillary. Right? And better is would be the tissue. Right? PO2 is 95. Saturation is 97 to 98 percent. PCO2 is 40. Now what happens? Oxygen will diffuse from oxygen will diffuse from the blood into the tissues. And CO2 will diffuse from the tissues into the blood. So that when I go on to the venous side of the capillary, the PO2 is reduced to 40, saturation is reduced to 75%, and PCO2 has increased to 45 millimeters of mercury. Exchange is happening at the level of tissue capillary. Now the tissues need oxygen. So oxygen will diffuse from the blood into the capillaries and CO2 from the, uh, sorry, from the blood into the tissues and CO2 from the tissues into the blood, right? So on the venous side, PO2 reduces, saturation reduces, PCO2 increases. Now this blood from the venous side of the capillary will now drain into the right side of heart, right atrium, yes? Vein, vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle from the right ventricle via the pulmonary artery into the pulmonary circulation and the complete chain will be repeated. This is how the respiratory exchange will take place. Please see this once again. At the level of pulmonary capillary, venous blood comes via the pulmonary artery. Venous blood means PO2 40, saturation 75, PCO2 45. As it passes through the pulmonary capillaries, oxygen will come from the alveolus into the pulmonary capillary and CO2 diffuses into the alveoli. So what happens on the arterial side or in the pulmonary vein? PO2 is 100, saturation is 100%, PCO2 reduced to 40. This goes to the left side of heart. Once it comes into the aorta, there is a further reduction in PO2 and saturation. Why is that so? This is because of physiological shunting. Part of venous blood from the coronary bronchial circulation drain directly into the left atrium. Now this arterial blood from the aorta goes into the tissue capillaries. Exchange will happen. Oxygen will move from the tissue capillary into the tissues. CO2 from the tissues into the tissue capillary. So that on the venous side of the tissue capillary, PO2 is reduced to 40, saturation reduced to 75, PCO2 increases to 45. This now goes towards the right side of heart, pulmonary circulation, left side, physiological shunting, tissue capillaries, and so on. This is your respiratory exchange. Okay? Respiratory exchange. Two important questions. Let's see the first one. First says the Oh, Sakshi Jin, PCO2 ka jo farak hai na, that is not noticeable, not significant. Why? Because PCO2, the difference between arterial and venous blood is, arterial is 40, venous is 45. Have you understood me? So PCO2 is not going to show me a very large change, right? Because the volume of blood which is mixing is small. But PO2 will be, PO2 will be reduced. Now, two important questions. The first one is, 
what is the pulmonary capillary transit time what is the pulmonary capillary transit time pulmonary capillary transit time is 0.75 to 0.8 second transit time ka kya matlab hai what is transit transit time means how long does the blood stay in the pulmonary capillary pulmonary capillary the blood stays only for 0.75 to point 0.75 to 0.8 seconds. That means the time which is available for exchange in the pulmonary capillary is less than one second. Second important point: What is the tissue capillary transit time? What is the tissue capillary transit time? Tissue capillary transit time is longer. That is one to two seconds. One to two seconds. Okay, tissue capillary transit time. Tissue capillary transit time. Okay, Shibin Sarka Shankar. Yeah, you can doubt what it is. In tissue capillary. oxygen we should go from capillary to tissues na and co2 should come from tissues into the capillary ye to basic hai theek hai all right so tissue capillary transit time is 1 to 2 right now um answer this question now this says larger change in po2 larger change in po2 Occurs in, occurs in tissue capillary, tissue capillary or the pulmonary capillary. Larger change in PO two occurs at the level of tissue capillary or pulmonary capillary. See, if you look at the tissue capillary, the change in PO two is from ninety five to forty. In the pulmonary capillary, the change in PO In the pulmonary capillary, the change in PO two is from forty to hundred. Forty to hundred. Okay. So that means larger change in PO two is at the level of pulmonary capillary. Pulmonary capillary, right? This will be at the level of pulmonary capillary. Please, what do you understand by transit time? ट्रांजिट टाइम का मतलब है कि गाड़ी स्टेशन पर कितनी देर के लिए रुकी है ब्लड इज टेकिंग जीरो पॉइंट सेवन फाइव टू जीरो पॉइंट एट सेकेंड टू क्रॉस द पलमरी कैपिटरी दैट मीन्स टाइम अवेलेबल नॉट टेकन अवेलेबल फॉर एक्सचेंज ऑफ गैसेस इज पॉइंट सेवन फाइव टू पॉइंट एट सेकेंड इन द टिश्यूज इन द टिश्यूज इट इज वन टू टू सेकेंड ठीक है So larger change in PO two is at the level of the. I've, I've scrolled up. What do you want, Swati Subramaniam J Subhashni? Pulmonary capillary transit time is zero point seven five to zero point eight second. Tissue capillary transit time one to two seconds. Larger change in PO two at the level of pulmonary capillary. Okay, chalo. Is everybody okay with this? What? Why? Hmm. Okay. All right. Now, this is as far as your respiratory exchange is done. Respiratory exchange. Next, let's have a look at transport of gases. Gaseous transport. Transport of oxygen. Transport of oxygen. Yes. Now, transport of oxygen occurs in two ways. What is the transport of oxygen? This will occur in two ways. Two ways. Number one, with hemoglobin, and number two, as the dissolved oxygen with hemoglobin and dissolved oxygen. Transport of oxygen occurs in two ways: with hemoglobin and dissolved oxygen. Now, if you look at the arterial blood and the venous blood, 
I've already told you how much is the total O2, 19 ml per 100 ml. Venous blood is 14 ml per 100 ml. Now, Nineteen ml per hundred ml, and venous blood is fourteen ml per hundred ml. Now the dissolved oxygen, dissolved oxygen is zero point two nine ml per hundred ml. That means eighteen point seven one, eighteen point seven one ml per hundred ml is in combination with hemoglobin. Dissolved oxygen is just 0.29 ml per 100 ml of blood. Oxygen in combination with hemoglobin, 99.99% of oxygen is in combination with hemoglobin. Total oxygen in the blood is 19 ml per 100 ml. That is true. Majority of the oxygen is in combination with hemoglobin. See, that is why a patient of anemia, hemoglobin decreases by let's say two grams patient becomes symptomatic isn't it isn't it he becomes symptomatic maybe there is faint there is uh, he's not able to exercise there is breathlessness right because majority of the oxygen if you look at the venous side the dissolved oxygen is even lesser it is just 0 0.12 ml per 100 ml so with hemoglobin it is 13 point 0.88 ml per 100 ml of blood. 99.99% of oxygen is in combination with hemoglobin. So that means if I want to see what is the oxygen content of the blood, oxygen content in ml per 100 ml, oxygen content in ml per 100 ml, that means I must know what is the oxygen in combination with hemoglobin. Oxygen in combination with hemoglobin. Abhi, Abhi, Alice Jackson, patience, just give me a little time. I'll explain it to you. Just give me, just a little patience. I know what are the doubts which are going on in your head. Okay, oxygen in combination with hemoglobin plus what is known as the dissolved oxygen plus the dissolved how do i calculate the oxygen content this is going to be oxygen in combination with hemoglobin plus the dissolved oxygen this will give me the total o2 total o2. now the next is how to calculate this how do i know what is the total oxygen total oxygen oxygen in combination with hemoglobin plus the dissolved oxygen now, oxygen in combination with hemoglobin, this is going to be, how do I calculate this? This is hemoglobin in grams per deciliter into 1.34. Somebody has been writing this again and again. How do you, why one into 1.34? Because one gram of hemoglobin can transport 1.34 ml of oxygen, right? Into the percentage saturation, this will become important into per percentage saturation is also important have you understood plus the dissolved oxygen right plus the dissolved oxygen so hemoglobin in grams per deciliter into 1.34 into percentage saturation okay see um you have been discussing since your first year what is anemia Remember, anemia was a decrease in oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Anemia is decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Right? This anemia could be due to a decrease in hemoglobin. There is a decrease in hemoglobin. Anemia could be due to a decrease in hemoglobin. Right? Decrease in hemoglobin, for example, hemolytic anemias, hemolytic anemia, right? Or let's say an iron deficiency anemia, yes? If there is decrease in hemoglobin, there will automatically be redu reduction in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Or 
oxygen carrying capacity can also reduce, can also decrease if there is a decrease in saturation. Hemoglobin is normal, but saturation is reduced. Two reasons for anemia, a decrease in hemoglobin or a decrease in saturation. A decrease in saturation will also reduce the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And what are the conditions where there is going to be decrease in saturation? This is seen in methemoglobinemia. Methemoglobinemia. What happens in methemoglobinemia? Methemoglobin. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My laptop has run out, run out of battery. One second, just, just give me a minute. Just give me a minute, please. What happened? Sorry, sorry. <gasps> I don't know what's happening. It's not responding. Kagya with a laptop. Sorry, just give me a minute. All right. Okay. Now what's happened? Sorry, sorry, um, I can't, uh, we've lost our surface. Just give me a minute, please, so sorry. Oh, one note chala gaya. Oh, one note chala gaya tha battery.
sorry, sorry, so sorry, I uh, some technical problems. Okay, um, let's see this. All right. Good Lord, I have to sign in again. Ye kya hai? Again, give me a minute, please. Sorry. Okay. Chuck, so I think um, we are back. Hopefully, there should not be any problem. Take care. All right. Now, this is now I was trying to tell you is oxygen transport, and we said oxygen content is a calculator. Oxygen in combination with oxygen in combination with uh, hemoglobin. This is hemoglobin in grams per deciliter into 1.34. Oxygen in combination with uh, hemoglobin. This is hemoglobin in grams into 1.34 into percentage saturation. Anemia is a calculator. Capacity, right? Uh, in, increase in the oxygen carrying capacity, and that is, for example, it could be due to a reduction in hemoglobin, that means hemolytic anemia, iron deficiency anemia, or it could be, for example, meth hemoglobinemia. What happens in meth hemoglobinemia? In meth hemoglobinemia, uh, now for instance, there are four heme in meth hemoglobinemia. Iron, instead of being in the ferric ferrous state, is now in the ferric stage. Fe three plus. Fe Fe three plus. Yes, it is in the ferric state. And when iron is in the ferric state, the heme cannot bind with oxygen. Right. So what will happen to the saturation of hemoglobin? With Saturation will now reduce. There is a reduction in saturation. And if there is a decrease in saturation, there is a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. This is seen in meth hemoglobinemia. Have you understood? Anemia could be due to a decrease in hemoglobin or it could be due to a decrease in saturation. Hemoglobin, how do you calculate oxygen in combination with the hemoglobin? Hemoglobin in grams per deciliter into 1.34. Why into 1.34? Because one gram of hemoglobin can combine with, can transport 1.34 ml of oxygen into, like I said, saturation. So anemia could be due to a decrease in hemoglobin or a decrease in saturation. For example, meth hemoglobinemia. Another condition where there is a decrease in saturation is in carbon monoxide poisoning. In carbon monoxide poisoning, again, there are um, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. What is carbon monoxide poisoning? Now, carbon monoxide, the affinity of heme and carbon monoxide, right? Affinity of Carbon monoxide and heme is 210 times, 200, the 210 times the affinity of oxygen and heme. Very, very high affinity of carbon monoxide and heme. So what happens is once carbon monoxide binds with heme, it becomes almost irreversible. It cannot, carbon monoxide cannot be displaced. Itna tight, itna zyada affinity hai. It cannot be displaced. So what will happen to the saturation? Let's say if two heme have got a carbon monoxide, what will happen to the saturation? Saturation of the heme with oxygen will now reduce. Will now reduce. And if there is a reduction in the saturation, there will be a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity. Decrease in oxygen carrying capacity could be due to decrease in hemoglobin or due to a decrease in saturation. Decrease in hemoglobin, uh, common conditions, hemolytic anemia, iron deficiency anemia, megaloblastic anemia, decrease in saturation, meth hemoglobinemia, 
self hypoglobinemia carbon monoxide poisoning these are the conditions which will decrease the the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood now let us see dissolved oxygen now let's focus on dissolved oxygen right now what happens in dissolved oxygen is dissolved oxygen is measured this is measured in millimeters of mercury dissolved oxygen is measured in millimeters of mercury by blood gas analysis by blood gas analysis right dissolved oxygen is measured in millimeters of mercury by blood gas analysis so my next point is PO2 in millimeters of mercury how much is this in ml per 100 ml of blood right in ml per 100 ml of blood right PO2 in millimeters of mercury is a how much is it in ml per ml per ml of blood to convert PO2 in millimeters of mercury how do you do that this will be equal to so dissolved oxygen in ml per 100 ml will be equal to PO2 in millimeters of mercury into into 0.003 ml per 100 ml per millimeter of mercury you have to multiply it by 0.003 what is 0.003 this is the solubility of oxygen this is the solubility of oxygen 0.003 ml per 100 ml per millimeter of mercury for example when arterial po2 is 95 how much is it going to be in the dissolved oxygen 95 into point or let's say first let's take for example if po2 is 100 100 means 0.00 100 into 0.003 or 0.3 ml per 100 ml of blood whatever is the po2 which you have measured by blood gas analysis multiplied by the solubility which is 0.003 ml per 100 ml per millimeter of mercury right that will give me the uh, dissolved oxygen in ml per deciliter yes this is whatever the po2 multiplied by 0.003 right we see this once again now when you look at the arterial blood and the venous blood i told you the dissolved oxygen in the arterial blood is 0.29 how did i get this figure Arti PO2 of the arterial blood is 95. We've done it so many times now. Multiply it to it by 0.003. This gives you 0.29 mL per 100 mL of blood. Venous blood, the PO2 is 40. 40 into 0.003 will be 0.12 mL per 100 mL of blood. How do you see dissolved oxygen? You are measuring it in millimeters of mercury. How to see how much is that in ml per deciliter multiplied by 0.003? What is 0.003? It is the solubility, right? Whatever is the PO2, multiply it by 0.003. This will give you the uh, 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 sorry. What is the dissolved oxygen? Take the PO2 in millimeters of mercury and multiply it by 0.003. Okay, let's have a look at the transport of oxygen. Majority of the oxygen is transported in combination with hemoglobin. Dissolved oxygen is just a fraction of the total. How do you see the oxygen content? Oxygen content in oxygen content in um, in oxygen in combination with hemoglobin plus the dissolved oxygen. What is the oxygen in combination with hemoglobin? This is hemoglobin in grams. Per deciliter into 1.34 into the percentage saturation plus the dissolved oxygen. Yes, I discussed with you what causes a decrease in oxygen carrying capacity: either a decrease in hemoglobin or a decrease in the saturation. Conditions which decrease saturation: methemoglobinemia, carbon monoxide. Dissolved oxygen, like I said, is measured in millimeters of mercury by blood gas analysis. How do you convert it into ml per deciliter? ml ml per deciliter this is 
PO2 in millimeters of mercury into 0 0.003 ml per 100 ml per millimeter of mercury, which is the solubility of oxygen. Yes, whatever is the PO2, multiply it by 0 0.003, that will give you the dissolved oxygen. Right? Now, the important point here is zoom out. Now, uh, the important point I've just told you is dissolved oxygen is just a fraction of the total. 99.99% of oxygen is in combination with hemoglobin. Then what is the importance of the dissolved oxygen? Why is dissolved oxygen important? Why is PO2 important? Why, why do I need to know PO2 values? Why do I need to do a blood gas analysis? Because the PO2 will determine the saturation of hemoglobin. PO2 and saturation are related to each other. And how are they related to each other? This is, this is via the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. Oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. This shows you the relationship between PO2 and SO2. PO2, which is a dissolved oxygen, total but but the po2 will determine the saturation po2 will determine the saturation what is this oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve po2 in millimeters of mercury on the x-axis saturation as a percentage is on the y-axis po2 will determine the saturation you know, already know some values, PO2 and saturation. PO2, like I said, in millimeters of mercury. And saturation is a percentage. Arterial blood, PO2 is 95, saturation is 97 to 98%. Already done so many times with you. Venous blood. Venous blood is PO2 is 40 and saturation is 75. So these are two values which you have done so well and so many times now. Arterial blood, PO2 is 95, saturation is 97 to 98. Venous blood, PO2 is 40, saturation is 75. There is one more value which I want you to know and that is when the PO2 is 60, saturation is 89. Now what is the significance of knowing this? extremely important from a clinical point of view you have a patient in the icu if the pulse oximeter reading if the pulse oximeter if you've seen a finger pulse oximeter pulse, finger pulse oximeter is so much in the news today isn't it because of covid finger pulse oximeter says the uh, finger pulse oximeter gives you saturation not the dissolved oxygen Finger pulse oximeter gives you arterial saturation, not the venous. So if the finger pulse oximeter reading gives you, if finger pulse oximeter reading is, let's say, 85, are you happy with that? No. Because if saturation is 85, that means the corresponding PO2 is less than 60. And a PO2 less than 60, if saturation is 85, that means the PO2 is less than 60. And a PO2 less than 60 means this is hypoxia. That means here is my patient. I have to give him oxygen immediately. Have you understood? This is hypoxia. What is hypoxia? How do you define hypoxia when the RTV PO2 is less than 60? Saturation less than 89. Finger pulse oximeter, which gives you an arterial saturation. Arterial saturation. That is, that means the PO2 corresponding PO2 is less than 60. This means it is hypoxia. So these are three important, three important values which you must know. So when I plot these values. Let's see this, PO2 50, 100, saturation 50, 100. PO2 of 95 corresponds with the saturation of 97 to 98%. PO2 of 60 corresponds with the saturation of almost 90%. PO2 of 40 corresponds with the saturation of 
75. At different periods, if I see the saturation, I will get this curve. And if I plot, if I join these little dots, I get a sigmoid shaped curve. Sigmoid shaped curve. Right? This is known as the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. This is like the Greek letter sigma. This is a sigmoid shaped curve. Sigmoid shaped curve. This is your uh, oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. Nikita Nellore, that was a question which I, I gave you. If the pulse oximeter reading is 85, that means PO2 is less than 60. At 89, PO2 is 60. Have you understood? Right? This is the, uh, if PO2 is less than 89, sorry, if saturation is less than 89, PO2 will be less than 60. Okay? Have you understood that? Somya and um, Nikita somewhere? Right. Sig this is a sigmoid shaped curve. The sigmoid shaped curve is because of the phenomenon of positive cooperativity. This is it is not a linear relationship. This is a, like the Greek letter sigma, sigmoid. This is because of positive cooperativity. What is positive cooperativity? You know that each hemoglobin has got four heme. Binding of the first heme with oxygen increases the affinity of the second, which increases the affinity of the third, which increases the affinity of the fourth. As oxygen binds to the hemoglobin, the affinity of heme and oxygen rises sharply. That is why it is a sigmoid shaped curve. Initially, very low affinity. As oxygen binds to the hemoglobin, affinity rises sharply. That is known as that is known as uh, that is known as your positive cooperativity. What is pos positive cooperativity? Binding of hemoglobin, binding of binding of oxygen with heme, binding of oxygen with heme increases the affinity. Increases the affinity of heme for oxygen. Yes, increases the affinity. That is known as your positive cooperativity. Now, the next important point is what do you understand by P50? What is P50? P50 is the partial pressure. P50 is the partial pressure at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated. This is the partial pressure at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated. Partial pressure at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated. This is 50% saturation. The partial pressure at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated, this becomes P50. Partial pressure is 50% partial pressure of oxygen at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated. Okay? This is going to be P50. And how much is normal P50? Normal P50 is 25 to 27 millimeters of mercury or 3.6 KPA. What is KPA? KPA is kilopascals. Kilopascals. 3.6 kilopascals. 25 to 27 millimeters of mercury. This or 3.6 kilopascal. The relationship of 1 kilopascal is equal to 7.5 millimeters of mercury. 7.5 millimeters of mercury, right? What is P50? P50 is the partial pressure, partial pressure at which hemoglobin is 50% saturated. How much is normal P50? This is 25 to 27 millimeters of mercury. 
or what is also known as 3.6 kilopascals. See, pressure can be measured in millimeters of mercury, centimeters of water, kilopascals. In terms of kilopascal, it is 3.6 kilopascal, or and what is the relationship between kilopascal and millimeters of mercury? One kilopascal is equal to 7.5 millimeters of mercury. Now let us see what is the right shift of the curve and the left shift of the curve, right? Right shift of the curve and left shift, yes? Sigmoid shape, like I said, is because of positive cooperativity. Binding of one, first heme with oxygen increases the affinity of second, which increases the affinity of the third, which increases the affinity of the fourth. That is positive cooperativity. Now, right shift of the curve. When I say right shift of the curve, right? Right shift of the curve. What will happen to P50? P50 will show an increase. There is increase in P50. Or in other words, that means there is a decrease in affinity. Increase in P50 and decrease in affinity, right? Right shift means an increase in P50 and decrease in affinity. But if it is a left shift of the curve, if it is a left shift of the curve, now what happens? Left shift means there is going to be decrease in P50 or in other words, increase in affinity. Right? right shift, increase in P50, decrease in affinity. That means, why decrease in affinity? Because that means now I need more partial pressure of oxygen to saturate the hemoglobin to 50. Left shift, fall in P50 or an increase in affinity. Less partial pressure of oxygen to saturate the hemoglobin to 50%. Now, let me see what is what are the conditions which cause a right shift. I'm doing a very simple topic, right and left shift. The ones who are not interested, uh, I mean, it's okay. It's, it's not a difficult topic at all. Okay? And the ones who can, so uh, please feel free to leave. I'm not going to hold you back. Yes? But uh, uh, let me complete this topic. Right? What is What happens in right shift? Right shift of the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. Right shift of the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. Now, there is increase in P50 or a decrease in affinity. Right shift means there is an increase in P50 or a decrease in affinity. And I remember this as FDR. What is FDR? Favors delivery. Favors delivery or disassociation. Favors delivery or disassociation. Shift to right. Favors delivery or disassociation. Shift to right. Please remember a right shift of the curve. Right shift of the curve is means an increase in P50 or a decrease in affinity. Less affinity means less association means more disassociation. Favors delivery or disassociation shift to right. Now, what are the conditions which will cause a shift to right? If there is increase in PCO2, increase in H plus, decrease in pH increase in temperature, increase in 2,3 BPG or hemoglobin S. Increase in PCO2, increase in H+, decrease in temperature, increase, increase in temperature, increase in 2,3 BPG or hemoglobin S. All these conditions will cause a shift to right and shift to right means more delivery of oxygen. Now, increase in 2,3 BPG. What are the conditions which cause an increase in 2,3 TPG? And a little bit small mnemonic for that. Gita. 
Whenever there is increase in growth hormone, exercise, growth hormone, exercise, thyroid hormone, increase in thyroid hormone, anemia, high altitude, high altitude, and androgens. These are the conditions which will increase 2,3-DBG. If there is increase in 2,3-DBG, there is a shift of the curve to the right. Shift of the curve to the right, right? Let's see this once again. Right shift of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve means increase in P50, decrease in affinity. Remember this as FDR, favors delivery or disassociation shift to right. What are the conditions which has caused a shift to right? Increase in PCO2, increase in H+, decrease in pH, increase in temperature, increase in 2,3-DPG, hemoglobin S. Increase in 2,3-DPG is what is a mnemonic? Gita, growth hormone, uh, exercise, thyroid hormone, anemia, high altitude, androgens. Why increase in 2,3-DPG causes a shift to the right? This is because, this is because 2,3-BPG and oxygen bind at the same place. But one very, very important difference, and that is 4 moles of oxygen, 4 moles of oxygen bind with 1 mole of hemoglobin, but 1 mole of 2,3-BPG binds with one mole of hemoglobin. Both 2,3-BPG and oxygen bind at the same place. If there is more 2,3-BPG, the binding with hemoglobin with oxygen will reduce. Both oxygen and 2,3-BPG will bind at the same place. But four moles of oxygen bind with one mole of hemoglobin and one mole of 2,3-DPG binds with one mole of hemoglobin. Both are binding at the same place. More 2,3-BPG, less binding with oxygen. Less 2,3-BPG, more binding with oxygen. Yes? Next, let's see what are the conditions which will cause a shift of the curve to the left. Left shift of the curve. Left shift of oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve means decrease in P50 and an increase in affinity and remember this as fal what is fal favors affinity favors affinity a shift to left favors affinity a shift to left right fbr favors delivery favors disassociation FAL favors affinity, favors association. Shift to left. Conditions opposite now. If there is a decrease in PCO2, decrease in H plus, increase in pH, hypothermia, decrease in 2,3 BPG, decrease in 2,3 BPG. Hemoglobin F, myoglobin, and banked blood. These are the conditions which will cause a shift of the curve to the left. Shift of the curve to the left. Right? Decrease in PCO2, decrease in H+, increase in pH, decrease in temperature, decrease in 2,3-PPG, hemoglobin F, myoglobin, and banked blood. Why banked blood? Just two important points here. Why banked blood? Because when you store the blood in the blood bank, glycolysis is inhibited. Glycolysis is inhibited. 2,3-BPG is a byproduct of the glycolytic pathway. Decrease in 2,3-BPG. If there is a decrease in the 2,3-BPG, there is increase in affinity increase in oxygen affinity. More 2,3-BPG, less affinity. Less 2,3-BPG, more affinity. 
More affinity means left shift of the curve. So banked blood glycolysis is inhibited. There is decrease in 2,3-DPG, increased affinity. Let's have a look at Now, here it is. Um, let's see the last point today, and that is what happens in HBF. In HBF, like I said, it is a left shift of the curve. Le left shift of the curve. Right? Now, what happens is if, let us see, this is a normal oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. The HBF curve is to the left of normal. This is the HBF and the oxygen disassociation curve. HBF and the oxygen disassociation curve. HBF and the oxygen disassociation curve. Why is it to the left? Because what when you look at HBF, this is alpha 2, gamma 2. Adult hemoglobin is alpha 2, beta 2. This is alpha 2, gamma 2. And remember, the gamma chain of HBF, gamma chain of HBF has a lower affinity. It has a lower affinity. For 2, 3 BPG and therefore higher affinity for oxygen, lower affinity for 2, 3 DPG and therefore a higher affinity for oxygen. Why is the HBF curve to the left of normal? This is because HBF has alpha 2, gamma 2. Gamma chain of HBF has a lower affinity for 2, 3 BPG and a high, therefore a high affinity for oxygen. Have you understood? Adult hemoglobin is alpha 2, beta 2. Fetal hemoglobin is alpha 2, gamma 2. So gamma chain of HBF has a lower affinity for 2, 3, BPG and higher affinity for oxygen. If you look at the myoglobin and the oxygen dissociation curve, extreme shift to the left. This is the myoglobin oxygen disassociation curve. This is a rectangle rectangular hyperbola rectangular hyperbola extreme shift to the left very very high affinity of myoglobin with oxygen myoglobin is present in muscles it is a storehouse of oxygen rectangular hyperbola what is the p50 for myoglobin p50 for myoglobin is only 5 millimeters of mercury. When the PO2 is 5, myoglobin is already person saturated. Very, very high affinity. Last point for today. One mole of myoglobin binds with one mole of oxygen. Where is myoglobin present? Muscles. This is a storehouse of oxygen. Very high affinity of myoglobin for oxygen. What is the P50 for myoglobin? Just 5. At PO2 of 5, myoglobin is 50% saturated. One mole of myoglobin binds with one mole of oxygen. Do you see this? Oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve is a sigmoid shaped curve, positive cooperativity. HBF curve is to the left of oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve because of the gamma chain. Myoglobin oxygen dissociation curve is an extreme shift to the left because of very, very high affinity. So um, we will continue with it with everything next time. We'll finish off all the balance uh, topics next time. Okay? I'm so happy that you could sit through 13 hours of class today. Yes. Though this is 13 hours is absolutely usual thing for us in a face to face class. But for some reason, you all are tired even sitting at home. Okay? Okay. And uh, thank you so much. And um, 
Good night. Any question? Let me see if there's any sensible question. Okay. All right.